Welcome to To The Point, everyone. In today's episode, we are talking uh, veterans, and we're talking to a veteran, and it's all about Veterans Day. We're actually recording this on the Marine Corps birthday, so fitting to Marines, we'll be having a discussion. Today's guest is Brigadier, retired Brigadier General Norm Cooling, yes, right, from the United States Marine Corps. Uh, excited to have this retired general on with us uh as a retired brigadier general in the beloved marine corps uh he served uh as part of headquarters of the marine corps which is an eighth and i if you haven't if you're playing at home served numerous roles during deployments in support of operation enduring freedom in afghanistan and operation iraqi freedom and most notably served as the battalion commander for america's battalion 33 for those of you playing at home yes i'm a proud member of being part of 33 and 23 so i'm excited to welcome to the show Mr. No, I keep. I, I want to call you Brigadier General, Sir Norm. I have all these names in my head. They're all struggling. The enlisted Marine in me is like, he's a general. You call him Sir. So welcome to the show, Norm. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's good to be here, Eric, and uh, happy 245th birthday. Whew, 245. Our Corps has seen a lot of things, hasn't it? I mean. Yes, it has. It's come a long way from... Uh, you know, those Marine sharpshooters in the mass of uh, privateers in the revolutionary period, long way. I don't think people get, uh, I think they're seeing it on social media, but they don't understand our camaraderie has no bounds. It has no rank. It really doesn't matter when you served. I don't see this in any other branch and I'm not knocking on any other branch. Everybody knows we always have folks from the army on here. Of course, some of our favorites are from the air force. But when it comes to the Marines, I see people all the time, they're amazed the moment that you see two Marines, it doesn't matter the age difference. I ended up at a coffee shop just a few short weeks ago. There was a police officer in front of me. So I simply said, hey, I just wanna, I wanna buy your coffee. And he's like, he's like, man, I'm good. I'm like, no, thank you. And I could see he cringed when I said, I just wanna thank you for your service. And he cringed. I said, man, are you a vet? <laughs> He started laughing. I'm like, he's like, why would you ask that? I said, because I'm a Marine. And every time I get thanked for my service, I kind of do your same face. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Like, I volunteered. I wanted to be a Marine. You don't need to thank me for doing something I absolutely loved every minute of. And he's like, er, and we started talking. And, you know, he wasn't an 11. He was a pogue. And we kind of went back and forth on that. And, yes, I called him. <laughs> Instantly, if you're not if you're not an if 03, you instantly become Pug. That's I don't think the Marine Corps changed in that wreck. And it's like infantry. No, Pug. We, we definitely still take for a pride in our respective uh, portions of the Corps. Right. And probably, uh, you know, notably, uh, we we still believe that the 0311 is the tip of the spear, and ultimately, everything in the organization supports that person's ability to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire maneuver what the general said <laughs> just go with that if you're ever wondering anything about marine corps here we are we're here to answer it uh you know let's talk about this and i keep struggling i'm gonna call you norm i'm gonna do my best if i call you sir uh, deal with it it's my show uh <laughs> what i have for you today it's my show we're gonna do it my way uh <laughs> that's Fair how we enough. do it here uh, at to the point so interesting times we live in uh we we've we've seen the dod change again just this week as a former flag officer uh, and you've served with general mattis uh in when you were in the corps uh he was a great leader great uh, everyone of course loved him as dod uh head of the secretary of defense what does this mean to you I, I, let's not be political we don't need uh, i'll probably turn it political you don't need to but it's very concerning that we have this much turnover at the most, the highest position within the Department of Defense. The Secretary of Defense is the almighty. If, if we're going to be attacked, this is a person who we want to, our troops to believe in and understand what they're doing. This is concerning. And what's your thoughts on this as somebody who's been around this kind of position? What, you know, what does that mean to you for national security? Well, I mean, it's certainly never good to have uh, 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 disruption or lack of stability in senior leadership positions in any enterprise, defense or otherwise, Eric. But uh, so it would have been uh, better if um, if uh, the secretary of defense could have stayed uh, uh, longer. Um, uh, 
uh, throughout this administration. At the same time, it's certainly not unusual for um, senior officials in an administration that's coming to the end of a four-year tenure to uh, to leave. That 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 uh, this portion of of the administration, that it's actually pretty typical. I mean, the circumstances of the current secretary's departure are regrettable, um, but. Uh, one thing I, I would I would particularly highlight is Secretary Mattis's national uh, defense strategy uh, has remained intact. So from the original SecDef, uh, the strategy that that the leadership within the Pentagon uh, and within the Department of Defense has continued to pursue is the strategy that he spent uh, a considerable amount of his first year uh, developing. Uh, I mean, yeah, and he was a great leader. Uh... So, I mean, that's, it's just concerning because we see so much and the military is always thrown into the fray over everything, uh, this administration included. Uh, you know, we've seen some things that I've never thought I would see before in our city streets. I mean, I've seen the National Guard deployed. That's normal. But National Guard helos buzzing and doing dust-offs over citizens. We're crossing a lot of lines here, and you don't have to pick a side, but you have to know as somebody who's worn a uniform, you're a leader. How are these... Explain to folks that there's a difference on how we think, and I'm coming to this as an enlisted Marine. Obviously, I want your opinion as a flag officer. It means a lot more to me. You guys have to follow orders also. Everybody thinks just because you guys have some stars that they're like, nobody's going to question the general. You guys have bosses above you. Somebody's given this order. And if an order comes from the president of the United States and orders people to do things, you don't get to question those orders. The, you know, it's not how this system works in the chain of command. Can you kind of break that down for the folks at home? A lot of people ask me, well, why does this keep happening? And I'm like, you can't blame our folks wearing the uniform. They're not to blame. They're following orders. We don't get to question orders. That's not something that is part of like the UCMJ is like, hold on, I'm going to question what they tell me to do. No, I, that's a good point. Um, I mean, the Constitution is very clear on that matter. Uh, the president is the commander in chief. So if the president issues a legal order, then then we follow it. If uh, if there's some feeling that uh, that an order is illegal, uh, then I think we all believe uh, inherently that we have a moral responsibility to refuse that. But in the instances that you're talking about, that none of that would be would be very clear. Um, I mean, it's certainly not an immoral order, the, the, the example that, that you're citing, Eric. So um, that's the way the Constitution works. Now, our, our oath is to the Constitution, but regardless if you're a general officer, if you are a member of the military, or you're the commander in chief, um, it's not to uh, an, an individual, uh, but at the same time, we have to balance that that uh, that fact with uh, the commander in chief uh, is the president of the United States uh, by the Constitution. Yeah, and and I think people at home need to realize, and I mean, you've worked in D.C., you get it. This is the commander in chief. We don't care who the person is. It could insert name, and that is the president. That is the CIC. We don't. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. We don't. We don't serve a name we serve a, a title president just like you know we follow orders from those who are senior to us this is how the game is played and i, I think people struggle with that so my question for you uh is we've especially in 2020 we saw a lot of retired generals and flag officers come out and uh endorse candidates which i thought was weird uh it's not something that i'm used to seeing you guys usually have your club and you guys keep to yourself and you retire and you're really good at playing golf and telling war stories because you guys have done it all. Uh, and that's not a knock. It's just it, that enlisted guy was coming out. So, I mean, I mean, do you believe that flag officers and retired generals should be endorsing candidates or because that's a fine line because I've got into it with people. Because I've seen people, because they're so pro-president, that they'll be like, General Mattis is a traitor. We saw Sebastian Gorka, and everybody on this show knows how I feel about that man. Sebastian Gorka came out just a few months ago and wrote this scathing article that Mattis isn't a Marine, he's a traitor to us, which in, just riled the ranks beyond all belief because there's a lot of things you could call Marines, but you don't call our Patton 3.0 who I think could take Patton personally. I mean, that little dude with his glasses, he just, that warrior monk in him. <laughs> I mean, Patton was tough, but I think the warrior monk would just 
climb in his head and run around. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, it's a different world we live in. These generals kind of have their play. Is Mattis like an exception to the rule because he's been so public about it? Wrote an amazing book. Uh, he's worst. I mean, he he's almost like a godlike figure. I know to the Marines, we all kid around. You know, Saint Mattis is what we all affectionately go by. I mean, how does this work with endorsing folks coming out against a lot of people like Mattis had no right to attack the president? How do you feel? I didn't feel what he wrote was an attack. I thought it was the truth, which I don't have a problem with. Uh, it's also Mattis, so I cut him just like, whatever, it's Mattis. <laughs> <laughs> Be different. It was like Private Schmuckatelli writing the book, okay? It's completely different. Private Schmuckatelli has no qualifications. Mattis, 44 years. I'm like, I'm going to let the guy say what he wants. Uh, what's your thoughts on uh, it? I, I mean, I think General Mattis is, uh, is a, a, a big boy. Uh, and capable of handling criticism yeah. <laughs> uh, pretty pretty easily because he he certainly has a professional reputation and a history as being one of our greatest intellects uh, and one of our more most uh, proficient war fighters in the nation's history. Um, and I think history will prove him to have been a a, a very capable um, and exceptional, in fact, Secretary of Defense, particularly because of the national defense strategy that uh, that he evolved and, and put in place uh, during the administration. Um, with regard to general officer endorsements, uh, Eric, um, that's a new dynamic for me uh, as well, quite honestly. I mean, I, I was solicited uh, to sign uh, letters, for example, in support of, uh, of both party major parties' candidates. Um, personally, I declined to do that. <clears throat> um, I, I believe that um, general and flag officers endorsing individual can the candidates are not uh, is uh, retired. Of yeah. course, active duty generals and, 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 and flag officers cannot do that. Um, but I think by extension, quite honestly, traditionally, um, retired general and flag officers have avoided that as well. And I, and I think that that remains a good uh, personal policy. Uh, now, I know people um, on both those letters, um, many of which I hold in very high regard, very capable, competent people of, of sound character. Um, and so I, they had to make a personal decision and they made it. They, they felt that passionately about one candidate or another. But to me, when you do that, you, you put you, by extension, the active duty general officers uh, in in a, a lens among the public and among our elected representatives to Congress. Uh, and we don't need uh, a political affiliation target on the back of, of uh, genuinely apolitical, constitution-serving centric uh, senior uh, officers in our military, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. But before we keep going, I want to take a break here. This is where we'll this is where we'll change to a, a, a nec our next uh, segment. But uh, this has been amazing. Uh, this is I'm just having a blast here getting your insights. So we've been covering we're talking about flag officers and uh, how, you know endorsing political candidates. You guys see this all the time at home when you're watching TV. You've heard it in the election, heard it in the debates. How many generals for one? How many generals for the other? And you're probably like, well, how are these guys involved? Number one, most of them are retired when they're doing this because in uniform, you're not allowed to. Uh, the Hatch Act prevents that. I know it's loosely followed in this current administration, but we take our rules really serious. That's why we have something called the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And uh, trust me, it's heavily enforced and the military loves using it. And our beloved branch loves it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but Eric, yeah, just one thing on that. Mm -hmm. the, uh... You know, this is not a, a new dynamic with this administration. I mean, it, it really has started to surface in the last you know, 15 years or so that increasingly you see retired general officers and flag officers willing to make that affiliation. Yeah, I, I think mm -hmm. it's just another reflection of the polarity of our society. Uh, but again, I, neither one of those dynamics, in, in my view, is, is healthy for our for our nation. Yeah. So when we come back, we're going to, I want everybody to watch this episode. So make sure you check this out. Whoa, I'm dropping and throwing things while we're having a show. This is great. Uh, so 
Easy. Woo! <laughs> Marines involved here. I have it's Marine proof. It's not broken yet. Yeah, you should be happy. Don't worry, nothing <laughs> broke. Uh, but when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation. We're going to jump into the politi uh, current political system, uh, and I'd like to ask you a few questions when we come back. Uh, talking about veterans who are serving, we have a lot of them. Uh, Actually, we actually had a downtick in veterans that are elected into federal positions uh, this uh, in 2020. And I wanted your thoughts on that. And uh, kind of people are always like, well, why don't we have a president who served? That's a big question that we've had. I think it goes back to, you know, unfortunately, uh, President Butch was the last person who served. So when we come back, we're going to dive bomb into more of these questions uh, and on this Veterans Day. So everybody stay tuned. <laughs> 